Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming, and, and uh, hopefully we can get through this uh, easy enough. But uh, I got a few slides to go through, and like Riley said, there's a microphone in the back, so if you could all uh, just wait to the end of this presentation and then just identify yourselves and what club you represent, we'd love to hear from you and kind of help us all get through this together. So let's talk a little bit about how we came to be in this room today. Um, you all know that story? <laughs> there, well, no, not quite. There's a, about a year or so ago, we were dealing with uh, Kiva Bridge and Kiva Bridge card playing group. And um, they were uh, utilizing the Beardsley facility and they were doing what they do and that is play cards and invite people in that non-members here from people from the outside to join them in their in their card playing. Over the years that has grown and so the outside numbers of guests basically are outnumbering kind of on a two to one basis the people that are actually living here playing as a club. And so they're bringing in revenues um, to their association um, 501c7 and at the end of the year they refile their reported forms that are required to do so and their revenues were getting to a point where they needed some professional assistance in getting that done. So in talking with their accountant and whatnot, they processed all of their paperwork, everything that they needed to do, and uh, lo and behold, the accountant hands back their paperwork unsigned and informs them that they are in violation of the IRS code due to the gross receipts that they are bringing in are over the legal amount to do so and that they are in jeopardy of potentially losing their 501c7 status. That was brought to our attention and that was like someone dropping a big onion on my desk. And so we're trying to deal with how is this club going to continue? Um, can you just rent the building from us and does, how does that change? So we had conversations with our legal advisors, with our accounting staff, um, tax consultants and those types of things and how do we fix this problem but in doing so you know we peel back the onion a little bit and try to figure out well if this is happening to the Kiva group how many other folks are affected by this and we were somewhat amazed as to what we found and so as we put our as we work through the system and put our annual budget together these three items that you see behind me here have come to our attention the first one being financial advancements. These are things where clubs in the past have come up to the governing board via the budget process and seeking um, improvements to various venues or facilities that they operate out of. Pickleball courts, tennis courts, club rooms, that type of thing. And way back when, 15 plus years ago, um, softball wanted to have their infield fixed <clears throat> and it was about the time when uh, a, new, a new kind of a merge of uh, synthetic turf took place and they went from having their field dirt infield prepped on a daily basis to having a nice synthetic turf, low maintenance uh, scenario at their complex. That cost some money. And at the time, you know, the reserve funds with, the, with our organization, our association were such that didn't have a lot of liquid funding out there for a high priced item such as that and I think the discussions came and went and basically softball said we'll pay for it. Okay, moving along, okay, okay, okay. So that kind of I think started the program. And then since that time it's evolved a little bit. Pickleball, tennis got into the, well how are you paying this back? Well we sell some advertising, we put some signs on the outfield fence and naming rights on the field and we raise money and blah, 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 we can then pay off the cost of this grass, okay? Uh, unbeknownst to them at the time that advertising is considered outside income and again in violation of the IRS code. So pickleball, tennis, softball have advertising issues that we've uncovered um, based on these financial advancements that we have with some clubs if we advance you money, at, as the governing board advances you money, at, how are you paying that back? Well, they're selling products, they're seeking advertising, they're getting sponsors, they're doing all kinds of things that put them in jeopardy in the eyes of the IRS, unfortunately. So here we are 
coming into this budget season and the pickleball groups wanted to seek additional courts. And they came forward with a proposition of, you know, hey, can you help us out and loan us $960,000? We'll pay you back. Oh, how are you doing that? Well, we'll sell some advertising and you know, time out. We can't do that. The IRS is not going to let us do that. So the governing board took a real hard look at this financial advancement program, and we can't find anything in our policies that exist that deal with loans, right? You all pay your annual member dues to be residents here and expect service for that. And you are all club members, and those of you who are chartered club members have rules, regulations, and policies and procedures all in place to help you um, offset the cost of doing what you do on a recreational basis, right? That's our job is to service you all. That's what you pay your fees for. We have that fiduciary responsibility. We've got money in the bank. We invest money and we have a very good reserve fund to take care of those types of needs that you have. Moving on to the 501c7 tax status club and club revenues, oh, we've got 103 clubs that we deal with. Three of those are 501c3 and those have different rules by which the IRS operates and how they regulate what these clubs do and do not do. Those are the auto restoration facility, um, the library, as well as the radio station. The vast majority of the other clubs <clears throat> are 501c7 social clubs. And there are rules, regulations, and procedures for chartered clubs that are basically administrative guidelines as to how these clubs should run. Let me just take a quick minute here and just go through what is a social club, right? Basically a group of people that meet and generally formed around a common interest. Uh, they're exempt from federal tax uh, due to the 501c7 status if they are organized for pleasure, recreation, and other non-profitable purposes. Keyword there. So social clubs are membership organizations primarily supported by their annual dues, the fees that they charge their members, and, and such. So the central purpose of these social clubs is to provide benefits to the members, including access to social facilities such as clubhouses, craft rooms, social halls, and that type of thing. So the tax exemption for social clubs that operate properly only if the club's income is derived exclusively from club members. That's key. Once you open up the door to the general public, there are some accounting things that have to take place to make sure we're doing things correctly. Clubs should be taxed on all income derived from outside of their membership, including investment income. Now what I'm reading to you today, and everything you see behind me and through the rest of this presentation, anytime you see a white slide like this with some black lettering, I didn't draft this. This is a cut and paste right out of our policies, right out of our rules, and right out of our regulations that have been in existence for a very, very long time. Relatively new to the um, nonprofit world myself, I have a government background, and what I have learned over the last couple of years is Del Webb's pretty bright. Um, he's built some pretty wonderful communities in this country, and I really have found not a lot of things that he's done wrong. And so from the onset of Sun City to Sun City West to Sun City Grand and throughout this nation, these Del Webb retirement communities operate pretty soundly. They're good places to be and you should congratulate yourself for choosing here. We are number two in the nation. Congratulations to you all. Good choice. So 501 C7 organizations, right? In determining whether a club is operated for the pleasure and recreation of its members, the IRS looks solely at your sources of revenue. They don't care what you expend and how you pay artists or how you pay people that want to call dancing and those types of expenses that you may have as a club. The IRS is strictly interested. If you are a social club, they are staring at your revenue. So the generally, the social club support should be, again, from membership fees, the dues that you charge, if you have a monthly fee for a birthday club of your members to kind of treat people to lunch or cake, all good, as long as it's in the house. You go outside the house, problem. So a club's tax-exempt status is jeopardized by gross receipts from outside sources. And again, we go back to the rules, regulations, and procedures for chartered clubs. 
A non-rec card holder, guests, may be invited only by individual club members. They may not be open to public invitation. Again, strictly copied and pasted right out of the existing rules. Excuse me. Special events and tournaments require a written request to the Rec Center Association and, and on the specified forms. Clubs are not to advertise for non-member participation in public media to avoid the appearance of a commercial operation or solicitation. So having advertising all over our facilities, which doesn't happen, which is a good thing, is really kind of regulated as to why we do that. However, as you probably have seen, we have naming rights facilities and we have signs up and banners flapping in the wind um, doing that kind of thing. All clubs shall adhere to the commercial sponsorship and signage policies of the association. So there are some clubs um, that deal with this advertising scenario via naming rights, like I said, Liberty Courts at the Pickleball Center, the Mimo's naming of the tennis complex, and a lot of advertising around Liberty Field regarding the outfield fence. The money that is collected from advertising, basically, is a precarious trap for the unwary club officers seeking that money to help pay back these loans that we're giving out and whatnot, but it, in turn, it jeopardizes their tax status. That's outside revenue, not coming from club members, that the IRS frowns upon. So the sale of advertising is a non-traditional business activity because it really doesn't further the pleasure of the recreational need of the club. We can go out there and play softball today and the signs are on the outfield fence. I can take all those advertising signs down overnight and we go out there tomorrow and we, <coughs> we can still play softball. We don't need that advertising. It doesn't really affect the recreational needs of the club. So advertising is a big problem for some clubs and that's where the trouble lies. As a general rule, the revenue derived from advertising is considered non-member income. 501c7 clubs that advertise their facilities are engaging in non-exempt tax activity and the organization that exceeds a 15% limit set by the IRS may lose their 501c7 tax status. And we don't want to see that happen. Moving on to another portion of this program and that is non-member participation. We talked about Kiva Bridge earlier. Their numbers from outside guests far exceed the numbers participating that are actually owner members living here. And the same thing can be said for square dancing and the same thing can be said for various types of dances held in, on the evenings here in this room and other places. And that has become, again, peeling back the, the marvelous onion, where are we going with this? These facilities here are bought and paid for by you all. But it wasn't the intent, I think, to service Glendale, Peoria, Surprise, all these other communities not paying basically for the maintenance and upkeep of these facilities. So instead of chasing around and trying to build millions of dollars of new facilities, these facilities are amply provided for you here for owner members. But once we start opening the doors to the general public, things get tight. That's one issue. And the other issue is that it is really violation of the IRS tax code. So again, our rules and regulations stipulate that the general manager may recommend to the governing board suitable sanctions up to including revocation of the charter if we violate our RMPs or fail to comply with the stipulations of Arizona and IRS tax code. This has been drafted a long time ago. Somewhere along the line, I'm thinking back to where softball decided to change from a dirt infield to a grass infield, the train got derailed a little bit. And then from that point forward, things just started to change. Um, each club, I think, has to have an, a federal tax number, um, provide the, the, uh, the proper forms as far as filing taxes, and then the reasons for revoking a club's charter include violation of state and local government statutes. So. When it comes to tax status, right, a club that engages in business by taking and by making its social and recreational facilities available to the general public or by selling other products not organized and operated exclusively for pleasure, recreation and non-profitable purposes is not considered exempt. And so that's the hurdle we're trying to get. Now, I'm, 
I'm going to make an assumption here because <clears throat> I think the way Riley had these meetings aligned that most of you here today are dealing with craft issues. Okay. We're going to get through this. And, and we're going to do whatever we can to make things as smooth as possible during this transition. But we just have to make sure we take this train and put it back on the track and play by the rules. The rules are here. I'm a former sports official, right? They give me a rule book. I know the rules. We enforce it, right? That's a good thing. Rules are good. And we just need to play by them. So over time, I'm not sure what happened, you know. Some of you have, have been here a long time. I've spent, grew up in Arizona, not born here, but I, I spent a lot of time here, and I can remember when Sun City West doesn't exist. I can remember having to drive a very long way from Phoenix to even find Sun City. There was a huge gap there called the desert. It's not there anymore, it's rooftop. So what's happened during that time period, right? And I, I'll go back and say 1984, as this place is being developed and moved into and golf is being played and whatnot, a credit card was invented. Didn't exist before 1984. 1991, the internet showed up. And now you have the World Wide Web and all the wonderful opportunities that that provides. And people are ingenious. They're very creative, as you craft people are. I'm a woodworker, right? I can sell things to people in another country without leaving my house. It's amazing, right? But again, we have to play by the rules. So when we talk about arts and crafts and being a tax-exempt club, you ask yourself, why? Why does the IRS allow us to have tax-exempt clubs? Because we're social clubs. They're not designed for pro as profit centers. And that is a little bit of the problem because after, again, peeling back this onion a little bit and back to the fact that you are ingenious and you're very creative, I will attest to that. Because looking back over the last 10 years, you all have generated over $7 million in sales. I mean, congratulations. That is a major league cottage industry in my eyes, right? Unfortunately, when it comes to social clubs, it's a little bit off the track when it comes to the rules. And so this is what we need to fix. So the sale of products or services for the association facilities for personal monetary gain is prohibited. That's been in existence for a long, long time. Bill didn't write that. Bill cut and pasted it on the screen. So any club member who sells items made with equipment within a club will face suspension from the club. I haven't suspended anyone in my two years here, right? We're going to get through this. This is new to all of us. So failure to comply with the IRS or the Department of Revenue requires and result in penalties to both the club and the association. I'm told it's either 5% gross or $10,000. I don't want any of your clubs to be facing that fine. I don't want the association to be negligent in any way and face those types of fines. And so we operating the village store and helping in, in a consignment world to foster those craft sales that are going on jeopardize us as well. And so with a little fiduciary responsibility placed on me as your general manager, I am looking out for your money, your invested money and your community that we live in. I get it. I get it. You are all craft makers, and I think you've all benefited from that very, very well. But th you're competing somewhat illegally when it comes to generating that revenue and not being taxed. And that's what the IRS is up against. They're the tax people. And f to have you all being exempt and selling crafts and products that you make is not what the IRS is looking at. Or the, they are looking at that, but they're not looking forward to doing that, right? So there's no reason you should be tax exempt and someone operating a business doing the same thing, paying taxes. So we just need to level the playing field. So the IRS has ruled that income received by clubs from members for non-recreational services should be characterized as non-member income for purposes of the gross receipt limitations. Mr. D'Angelo is present today. Um, he will help us talk a little bit about where we go with our end of year um, um, 
forms that we fill out and a little bit of calculations as to what we are going to be looking at to keep you kind of on track again when it comes to filings. Again, so any, any association that is over the, um, the, the limits set by the IRS is subject to losing their tax status. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the form that I think you all are familiar with. But what the IRS is looking at is basically no more than 15% of your gross sales should come from the general public's use of the social club's facilities or the services provided, i.e. the sales of merchandise. So at the end of the year, and Tim, I don't know if you want to get up and kind of walk folks through this. Um, the left side of this program here is a, is a brief example of some line items I think you're familiar with that basically calculate all of your annual revenue. But what Tim has added off to the right side of this program is a little bit of a calculated split between monies generated via your members versus non-members. And when you get down to the bottom of the form, you're going to see a highlighted cell that's going to say 30, that there's a calculated cell that says 30% of that revenue generated on an annual basis has come from non-members. And if you follow the, the red line arrow over to what is allowable in the world of the IRS, it's 15%. And so those, that's the game we have to play. Um, and we're going to, hopefully we can get you all there. Tim? All right, so, oh, can you go back? Yep. <clears throat> As you mentioned, the left side of this is um, the left side of this is the is the left half of the first page of your CR7. So normally it's going to have the income on this side, and then there's going to be a set of expense expenses that go on this side. And down at the bottom, you'd see net income. When Bill was structuring or putting this meeting together, he asked if I could come up with an example to kind of explain you know, how this 15% thing comes into play. So what I did, and this currently isn't on the form, but we'll work on something so that when the end of the year comes by, I'll, I'll probably get this in there somehow outside of the print range or off to the right. I, I, I looked through uh, a few dozen CR7s from last year, kind of looked at a lot of most of the activity that people have, including some of these, uh, you know, empty spots on the bottom where you kind of put others like badges, raffles, shirts, you know, AGA dues for the golf folks. So the one thing that this form doesn't do is we're asking you to, or sorry, the IRS is asking you to be cognizant of your non-member income and to make sure that you're staying within, you know, 15% of that. So the question is, you know, okay, how do I do that? Well, kind of running down this list, what I tried to do is kind of line item by line item said, okay, generally where is this, these, where are these funds coming from? Dues, uh, sales of supplies, membership dues, instruction fees collected. I'm going to generally assume that all of those are going to be directly from your members. They paid their dues, they bought raw materials, and you had somebody come in to teach loom work, dancing, craft, whatever. That's generally going to be all your members. So in one column, you can just say, okay, this is all my member income. And then when you get down to stuff like registrations for events or tournaments, that could be either. So I just kind of put 50-50 split on that stuff just for the purposes of the example. Special events could be either. You know, <laughs> again, we have a locker fee rental. I'm assuming that's primarily just going to be member Contributions and gifts, prize money, in theory, that could be either. Uh, <laughs> then we get to these two. So this is village store and craft fair, which you don't fill out directly here. You go to page four and you fill out, here's all my collections from the village store or the craft fair. Here's what I paid in taxes and commission. Here's what I paid back to my members. And this ends up being kind of a net number coming through here, uh, which again, uh, I put as mostly non-member for purposes of that, because I would assume most of your members probably aren't going to go to the village store and buy something. They'll just buy it when they're in the club. Okay. 
And then some other random stuff at the bottom, like I said, badges, shirts, whatever other kind of miscellaneous stuff. And then you can total these two items. You know, obviously here's your, here's your total receipts. So this outside divided by total receipts in this particular instance came up to 30%. Over on the other side that he referenced is, okay, they're, they're saying it's 15% is allowable, which is $982. And we've got over 2,000 here in this particular example. So that's kind of double, double where you should be. Now, the purpose of this form is, our purposes for these forms are not to measure your IRS compliance. These forms are for us, for the association to make sure the clubs are kind of to Bill's fiduciary responsibility thing. We want to make sure that the, clubs are correctly accounting for our residents' monies, dues, donations, all that stuff. And the only way we can do that is to kind of have you fill this form out. And again, I know you're, you, signed, <coughs> you signed up to, for a social club, not necessarily to be an accountant, and I'm sorry for that, but uh, it, there's a few things we look at. You know, your, your change in your balance sheet needs to kind of match up with what this change is. That's, that's all the farther we're generally going into it. But as this came out, I believe we will we'll add some help, helpful stuff in there for you to do this kind of work. Um, because I know it can be a little bit painful, but if you could just kind of take a look at this and say, yep, member, non-member. Now, based on the time I've spent with several dozen clubs helping with their CR7s, after the fact is going to be incredibly difficult to figure out where those funds came from. That expectation's not realistic. Part of it is, is going forward, when you're making, when your treasurer's making your deposits, need to, to keep your mind on the fact that I need to try, to try to understand how much of this is member income and how much isn't. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's not going to be an exact science, but the, I think the effort is what someone would be looking for, is yes, we've identified these things and identify them on your deposit because something that happens in January, next January when you're working on your CR7, highly unlikely that anybody's gonna recall what that particular deposit was for. So keeping notes as you go is probably the best way to help yourself there. Okay, thank you. And I just have one more slide which basically talks about uh, getting some help. Um, we have been asked um, in some previous meetings that we've held with a couple other groups here doing this, uh, if we could provide a list of, of uh, local consultants or whatnot that could, we could maybe publish that you could make phone calls to in the, in the world of tax consulting, and we'll certainly uh, look into doing that. But when it comes to making these decisions that affect the club's nonprofit status, it's Pretty, pretty critical to have a professional review of your, of your operations. Um, and a qualified accountant can certainly answer any of those questions. So with that, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. There is a microphone in the back of the room. If you could please use that so the rest of the folks can hear you. Um, we'd appreciate that. Uh, since we couldn't read that last chart, the final. Okay. Slide. We couldn't read that chart, really, but you reference page four. Page four does a netting from the point of view of the club. Are you changing that? At, at this point, I, I, I'm not intending on changing that. I just don't. I... Well, okay, I, I, enough said. Now, the things you didn't say that are in the RRMPs RR for selling from the village store is it is a consignment from the member to the store and, then, and the rec center assigns certain tasks to the clubs, inspection, delivery, pickup. You provide us the money to write the checks, but you give us a list of the names and how much. So how is the club response? If you're thinking of going away from netting, and having us do the gross, then you better rewrite the RRMPs now. Okay, so the checks that we write. No, not that you write, no. that we write. 
give me a second. All right, you do write one check to the club. So we, your, your statement was the village store is, is providing consignment sales for the club members. Correct. Those are the um, words. Being that we, the, the information, I, so I work in accounting, the information that we get back from the village store tells us to write checks to the clubs. Which, which means we are consigning for the clubs, not technically the members. But the RRMPs don't say that. Okay, I, I don't have the RRMPs memorized, so I cannot huh. speak to that. But line one of the sales. Oh, oh okay. Uh, but just from, from my standpoint, I'm writing a check to the club, which means, I believe, in appearance at least, that's saying that we're consigning for the club. That is the hiccup. Okay, the, the village store, so the, the association is in theory the village store. It's one of our, we run it, so yeah. the checks are written by, we have one group in our, in our organization that writes checks, and that's the accounting department. None of the, the rec centers don't cut checks, the village store doesn't cut checks. Now, the other documentation that you're referring to, I have not seen because that doesn't come to accounting. Well, if you need so, a copy of the RRMPs, give me your email address and I'll send it to you. <laughs> I, I, I have a copy right here. Okay. I deal. I, We also have paperwork that says this is a prohibited. We have a lot of confusing language in our documentation, be it our policies, be it our RRMPs and the like. We have a lot of issue that we're trying to clear up. What you're rectifying or what you're uh, uh, attempting to tell Tim, yes, there are, there's language in the RRMPs that I, like I told you earlier, I cut and pasted some of these things right onto the screen that are direct Right. Okay. We'll focus on the word prohibited for the time being because what the RRMPs say is that profitable sales are prohibited. These are social clubs. These are supposed to be, you're supposed to go into these clubs and utilize these clubs to entertain yourself recreationally and for pleasure. You want to make some spoons to stir some pasta? Good. You want to make 1,500 of them? Not good. Okay, and seven million dollars later, we find ourselves right here. But it's not currently being processed that way regarding consignment. It's going to the village store, and that revenue is then being turned over to the club in bulk form. The club, as an independent organization, is then paying its artists. The IRS is concerned not with the individual artist in this case, but the associated club 501 c7 wood club metal club name a craft club that gross revenue is what the irs is looking at not the individual artist okay okay you care to disagree but that's okay our attorneys have looked at this tax attorneys have looked at this our accounting department has looked at this and we're okay thank you Next. Mr. Swin, I am Linda Rush from Toy Key Silvercraft. Yes. And um, are you finished or can I ask yes. you a few questions? Please. Okay. I think everybody in this room has heard about what situation we are in. I think we totally understand that we are a social club and not allowed to so sell. It has been 
very well redundantly told to us. So my question is, in other words, we understand we can't sell anything at this point. What ideas do you have to help clubs out of this situation? Right. And that is something that obviously the governing board has to kind of come to terms with. The governing board is your agency representing you all as owner members in the creation and carrying out policies, right? So as our policies currently exist, like I said, I copied these into this presentation. And that. They and, need to right, be changed. So my hands, uh, I'll, I'm going to finish. Let me finish. My they, hands are, are tied at this point because I am in a position where I was handed a rule book and would you please follow these rules as a manager. That's my job. And so we found this issue and we are trying to come to terms with it. The first couple of steps that we're attempting to create here today is one is the educational piece and that is educating 103 clubs doing a whole bunch of different things into the compliance of getting this rec train back onto the track. Once that's assembled, right, we're going to regroup. We are in the middle of transitional seats within our governing board. So come the end of June, we have three new members and they meet right after they get seated and they go through a whole list of prioritized goals that they'd like to see accomplished during the next year's term. I would assume that this would be a rather high priority. And so at so. that point in time, we will discuss this issue and come up with alternatives. So we need attorneys in the room because opening up our clubs for consignment sales and the production of material or crafts in bulk form goes very far away from the original intent of Mr. Del Webb and how this community was formed. We well, understand that, that, we're, that that is away from the original plan. However, we are here. Now we need to change it. Right. And that's what I'm asking. Do you have plans for that, to change it so I, that we can at least it maybe change our tax status so we can become whatever's necessary, a business? If we became that, would that put this association in a tax situation? The association is a 501c4. Right. So we have different rules by which we play by. Right. Okay. So if clubs all gather and they would like to seek a different kind of tax exempt status yes. for you to be able to sell things like yes. everyone else in America does that pays taxes, right. you would have a hard time convincing the IRS and the Department of Revenue for some reason because you're special that you're tax free. I haven't figured that out yet. Well, if we We've became a business, a tax, a tax paying business, would, yes. that, would that jeopardize your 5014C, whatever it is? I think it jeopardizes your charter club status. I think it's in conflict with the way the policies are currently written. So basically we're done. No, I'm think, what I'm saying is once a governing board gets seated and they want to tackle this issue, the question then becomes what to do with these clubs. Do you I just want to have remain? one more question, and then I'll, I'll give up the, the podium here. Um, I know there's been a couple of people who have proposed to um, other people about the village store becoming a true consignment store. Mm -hmm. This would be a business under the rec center. And at that time, the club people would do the inspection. The person that created it would take it to the consignment store to be consigned, that consignment store would then act as a true consignment store, would sell the piece, would pay the person, would pay, send out the 1099s. Has that been looked at? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And we hope to get moving in that direction, but it is laced with legal issues currently. I understand, thank you. Hello. Hi. Good to see you again, Bill. My name is Gene Miran. I'm the president of the Stained Glass Crafters Club at the Palm Ridge Rec Center. Um, very well done presentation. I would like to request an electronic copy of the charts today. Absolutely. It'll be posted on the web. This is the last of the three meetings. It's being taped. I think you can find it on YouTube, but the presentation itself will be on our website. And okay. if you want it emailed to you, we can handle that too. Thank you. I do have a couple of additional questions. It seems that uh, we are one of the clubs that got a nice a uh, loan of $50,000 from the rec centers for the expansions at Palm Ridge. Right. 
that put us in a position of having to go out and figure out how to raise monies to repay that debt. Exactly. Our financial records are such that we're well below the threshold in normal years. This year we may be over that threshold because of this uh, special circumstance. Right. So I guess my question is, is there going to be a waiver for a one-year or two-year special circumstance while paying back a zero interest loan? Right. Uh, Mr. Finelli's in the back of the room. I, I know he can address that. We did have a, a conversation um, yesterday with our Budget and Finance Committee on that same subject. I know Pete presented, uh, I think there are about five clubs currently uh, that have outstanding debt to the association in the tune of about $500,000 or a little higher than that. Uh, the vast majority of that money um, is coming from the uh, ARC uh, club, the auto restoration facility. Um, I think that's about a $500,000 note in and of itself. Um, they're a 501c3, so again, different rules for them. So they are continuing to roll as best they can, and it's a 10-year program agreement that they have, so they're making, they're making their annual payments as they go. Um, we've got another outstanding one with a 501c3, and that's the Rotary Club for the Memorial Park out at Beardsley. Um, again, 501c3, and that's about a $23,000 note. Um, stained glass, I think that you're representing, is somewhere in the thirty dollars to $40,000 range. Out, outstanding, it's 30000 currently. There you go. And then, Pete, I don't know, there's another couple more. Tennis, I think, has a $20,000 note, and they're, they're, there's another one there. But we, we have talked about that. I don't think... Uh, it was the recommendation from the Budget and Finance Committee to um, um, make those go away. I think they're going to still require the clubs to kind of contribute as they can. Uh, pickleball, I think, is the other one with a $70,000 balance with money in the bank, and I think they can make their final payment in September. Um, but we're moving in that direction. But as far as your waiver, yes, we will work with you. We understand the situation as it is. Um, and Pete, I don't know if you, you want to add anything to that at all. Um, since it was published on that open forum, and hope you know there's ample discussion right here in front of everybody. The this note was given a 10-year repayment, with the first payment due one year after the Coons was open, or Palm Ridge, and the club has done very well. They're actually um, two years in in advance of their time period. So if I don't make sure I'm hearing you right, if it's a waiver all along the lines of now that things are changing on their ability to raise funds, then that's a different discussion. If you, but I don't need to be discussing a waiver with you when you're two years ahead of it, no, the no, time the, period. The request for waiver wasn't necessarily to waive the outstanding remainder of the loan. The request for an exemption, if you will, in dealing with the IRS and if we go over their percentages right. during this period of time while we're trying to... I'd prefer it. you um, stay within the guidelines and then we'll deal with the, the debt uh, yeah. with, uh, with the discussion on with you personally. Yeah, Gene, it's unfortunate that we got in this position. You know, it's just, it, it really, really is. But again, that's part of the, uh, the policy and, and programming thing that I think the governing board has tackled as far as cease and desist on these uh, advancements. I do have a couple of additional questions or, or sure. points to make. You're suggesting that uh, us craft clubs, many of which have relatively small budgets, small membership, go out and seek either professional accounting or legal guidance, which is an additional burden on each club. Right, right. right. Also in the RRMPs, I think there are rules published that state that clubs cannot go out and seek yeah. this professional Again, uh, representation. Right. We will work with you. I mean, if your revenues are such, I mean, there's, there's a handful of clubs that are real, real big hitters, mm -hmm. right? And then the, 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 the vast majority of the uh, hundred and some odd clubs that we have, you know, 100 501c7s, 80, 85 percent of them are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. There's just a handful of clubs. I'll start with the metal shop. That is number one on the list. They are a big, big seller. You know, um, I, I think, um, help me off offhand, I know wood shops in the, at least the top 10. Um, yeah, clay is a huge one as well. So those kinds of things, you know, the big hitters really, we, we just need to sit down and work with. Um, we can offer what professional advice we're, we've been getting but you know it's right here. It's that magical 15% number, 
and where the governing board wants to go in the future, that's what we really have to tackle. But the questions that you're presenting to us today are going to get synthesized and, and, and submitted into summary for the Budget and Finance Committee to review recommendations going back up to the governing board as to how we want to advance. So your input is, is great to have. I mean, love to hear it. A couple more points, quick points I'd like to make. Whenever you get into conversations like this that are rather legalistic, mm -hmm. you can put two or more lawyers in a room and get two or more different opinions. Yeah, so that was here this yesterday. So your interpretation and your lawyer, perhaps also in concert with the IRS. Right. But I'm sure there are conflicting opinions out there. Two things I just picked up on this presentation is you seem to want to use terms the general public and club member kind of interchangeably. We have an association. The association is property owners of Sun City West, mm -hmm. and you have the C4 tax status. Yes. We are C7 clubs under that umbrella. Yes. We have club members that pay additional dues. Yes. Well, when you talk, in, like this chart right here, it says general public. What is the general public? Is that a resident owner, yes. part of the association? Yes. Or is that somebody from Surprise that yes. doesn't live in the community? Anyone, if you name a club, and I'll, I'll use stained glass because I, I think I, you're in that club. You have, a, you have a, a list or a roster of stained glass club members. Members, correct. That is your club membership. Anything sold or revenue collected by you as a club outside of that list of rostered individuals is non-member funds. <clears throat> So this chart right here refers to the bottom two lines, out club, or outside uh, income limit of 35%. Yes. Income limit from general public, 15%. Yes. yes. So what is the general public? The two percentages are distinct and quite significantly different. What is the distinction there? Okay. So it's, it's not the best worded paragraph. And it's it's on the the previous slide was the the paragraph, but how they how they word this is, back in. Uh, I don't even know if this says the time frame. Okay, seventy six. So before seventy six, the five hundred one c seven required tax exempt clubs to be operated, organized and operated exclusively, for the club members. So they changed it to go from exclusively to substantially all and to go along with it. And so that's what that, that's what was happening is prior to 76, every dime of the money had to come from your membership in order to keep your 501c7 status. They realized that, look, we just can't, they, they, that was a little too strict. So they changed it to this substantially all and then put the 35 and 15 in. So what it says is 35% of your gross receipts, uh, including investment income, investment income and outside sources. Then it goes on to say within the 35%, no more than 15% of that can be from the general public's use of the club's facilities or services. You know, even, even there that uses the term should, yep. it does not say shall. Yep. No, and again, if you, if you go and research this stuff, every one of these things, if you look at following these things through and all the, all the decisions that have been made by the IRS, there's pages of case sites on every one of these things. So the IRS can go any way depending on the circumstances of each case. That's why they use fairly generic terms because they've decided on different sides of the same coin on, on occasion. And you, you'll, again, I've spent more time than I'd like to admit looking at some of this stuff. Uh, and so it's gonna be based on the, on the circumstances of, every, of, of the specific case. But this is, this, these are their general guidelines to follow. Thank you. Okay. No, it's 15 of the total, 35 of the total. So what's the it, it, again, like I said, it's an oddly worded, it's an oddly worded scenario. And to, the only thing I can come up with based on that wording is the 20% gap 
is for investment income because they reference investment income in the first part and then they say and the and the other 15 is from public use of of your facilities or services okay. so that's what it ha to me that's my interpretation of what that means but like i said the wording is peculiar hi i'm beverly owens i'm the president of creative silk flower club could you turn to the next slide for a second so I can ask a question about that? Um, so um, you confused me when we were talking about the income from the village store sales and income from the craft fair sales. The amount of income that shows up there is equal to the sales that are done by the club and not related to any of the um, members of the club. Okay. And you said at the very end that they're looking at total revenues that are coming in, but they aren't. They aren't looking at the total of what is being paid to us from the village store they should only be looking at the amount that is from the village store that is based, or from the fair that is based on sales that are made by the club, not the individual members. Yes, it's an aggregate total at the end of the year that needs to be kind of managed by each individual club, and that needs to be calculated. So whatever your, whatever your club brings in at the end of the year, considering all of your revenue, your membership dues, any kind of cake parties that you have, all of this, all of those numbers get calculated at the end of the day. Right, well, but I'll, that number for the sale, I'm just clarifying because of something else that you said that confused me. Right. The number from the village store and the number from the craft fair sales is not the gross number that we, the gross amount of money that the club has received from the um, village store, which includes what we pay out to the members. It is only the amount that was sold by the club. Okay. Gross sales, gross receipts is what the IRS is looking for, and no more than 15% of that can be from outside sources. You're still confusing me with the term gross receipts. Help, Tim. Okay. So that is, that's the one, and, and I know exactly where you're coming from. That's the one, again, the, the um, CR7 was not designed as an IRS compliance tool. It was designed as a profit and loss statement just to make sure that you guys are, are, are doing your accounting, okay? So those two numbers, you are correct. When you go to page four, which is where the, there's a separate page just for village right. store and craft fair, the numbers that end up on page one is the net. Right. Here's what I've got. I've got gross sales. I've got amounts, commission, sales tax. And I'm um, uh, sorry, village store commission, right? Sales tax and amount paid and amounts to paid to the members. Members. So this. Go ahead. So this truly represents the club's income from the village store and the craft fair. Right. So okay. you're you're correct on that spot. It's a little bit odd because it seems to kind of go contra to the gross receipts concept. Um, but. Club gross receipts, that, that's, that could be the argument and why they crafted it like this, is that that is actually the club's gross receipts that's, that's, from the that's village exactly store. Right. Yeah. So that's why I didn't change that or don't have an, an, an okay. at this point, I that's not. And, and that's fine, okay. you clarified it. Um, just wanted to let you know on this, if you're going to send this out to somebody, you need to change uh, line eight, where it shows that for um, parties and picnics, there was $500 brought in, and then you allocate $500 to members and $500 yeah. to non-members. So you might want to, if you're going to send this out to somebody so that they don't get confused. Sure, thank you. Um, and then the other thing that I was, um, I guess you answered the question about whether or not the, um, the uh, non-members included people who just don't belong to the club. 
and they anyone who doesn't belong to the club is considered a non-member as far as that goes correct yes ma'am okay the only other thing that i wanted to say is that i'm not so sure that um that it is contrary to what Dell Webb intended. There has always been a village store. If there has always been a village store, then he, then it was intended that we could make crafts and sell them. Now, it might be that at this point in time, because if you read what it says about selling our stuff, it says we're not supposed to sell it at a huge profit. You can recover your costs and stuff like that. So maybe there are people who are selling it for huge profits, but I got to tell you, that's not happening in my club. Right. Thank you. I get that. And thank you very much. And yeah, how this evolved, don't know, right? Because Sun City was built before Sun City West. No store there. So, right. So, and there always has been, correct. But then let's move over to Grand and the other 20 Dell Web communities across the United States haven't found a club yet or a store yet. So I think things have evolved. I think that maybe the gentleman learned something along the way. Don't know. I don't know the intent of the village store back then. I mean, we've done some history work on it, right? So I think, you know, if people were making product, potentially donate to the store to help sell, to go back to the club to replace a table saw or a band saw or a lathe, great. Um, back in the day, but things just have evolved over time. Okay. Right. And didn't pay tax. That's right. Yeah. And that's. You pay sales tax. Okay. But not personal income well, tax? I mean, you pay personal tax if someone um, got over $600 and had a 1099. Okay. Right. 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 Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I want to first of all say thank you for having this meeting today. There have been so many rumors and so much stuff. Uh, it's like that telephone game, you know, when somebody picks up the receiver and you get a piece of it and then the next person adds or whatever. So a lot of that is going on. And uh, perhaps, um, perhaps one of the things that is happening, uh, uh, those of us who are past years old have seen it happen many, many times, uh, is that oftentimes people who are in charge, um, and then there are the rest of us, okay? Uh, sometimes we don't feel like we're getting enough information or all the information, and as opposed to, uh, Something that you said today was very helpful, but I think it could have been said sooner and maybe in the future it, you might consider, uh, is that if every person in this room and at the other clubs that have, or the other groups that have come, if anyone wants to write their opinion or their recommendation, you need to accept that. Sure. You need to accept them long before you all sit down for your board meeting and decide it's time to look at it. That's part of people's frustrations. It's like, well, when do we get to say our part? Or when, when do you hear what we have to say? I'm sure that you've heard people be angry and upset. And I'm sure you've seen some of us look bewildered and wondered, you know, did we just step into a battle of rattles, rattlesnakes when we bought out here? Um, but in the midst of all of that, uh, you suggested that the clubs might want to get a lawyer. That's your, that's your job. Exactly. You, we pay, wait a minute, <laughs> we pay you and your, you know, we pay you to take care of what needs to be taken care of. And I can't say shame on you because all this other stuff happened in the past, but what I can say 
is if we have the same lawyer we had 10, 10 years ago, shame on everybody. Because why is it that this has been go going on this kind of period of time, why hasn't some lawyer suggested maybe we need to look at this prior to this time? And that doesn't, you can't go back and negate, you can't make things different. I'm not suggesting that. But some, what it feels like when we read the paper is like it's our fault or our responsibility. And uh, maybe it is if we're in a group that maybe uh, decides to charge $1,000 for something that maybe they only had $500 in their, you know, in their supplies. Maybe that's shame on them. Maybe they want to go to another consignment place and sell. But that's still your responsibility. These kinds of things needed to have been looked at by lawyers previous. You can't help it, but I need to say it. And the, um, we are not supposed to go pay lawyers. We come here, we buy here, we agree or we rent, but most of us are homeowners here. Um, uh, the other three quarters of the people have already gone to their other home, okay? But um, we're not supposed to get lawyers. That's your job. That, that's not our job. Um, that's what you get the big bucks for. And the, the other... Um, suggestion that I, I, I really strongly encourage putting out more information. I think what was in the paper last week was the best material I've seen since this stuff started. And it was the first time that I got personally a little inkling that maybe things could be okay. Maybe the world wouldn't be turned upside down. And when it comes to who puts the things in the, in the stores? I personally would not put anything that I made in the store. I just want to don't you know I don't have a cat in this game, in that part of the game. But if you write the checks to the club, I would suggest that that's probably something that also evolved over time. In the beginning, probably, and if you could research it, that might be an interesting thing to know. But probably they wrote the checks to individuals, if individuals put them in, or they could have. But maybe over time, when we grew and got bigger and bigger, it just seemed to be a lot easier to write one check to the club, as opposed to each individual person who consigned. So that, I don't think that's all on us either. I think that has to do with the boards, with uh, the way you see things. You're not looking at these things the same way we are, even if you're in a club. Uh, I thank you so much for your time and your willingness to host us. Um, it certainly would have been great if this could have happened when the rest of our community was here with some more lawyers. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Bill. Hi. Gina Ogle, president of Rip and Sew Club. Just a couple questions for you. So I think we've, we've gone over this, um, maybe not the way that I've had it written down here, but when we receive a check from the village store, I consider that gross, but our club only keeps 4% of that and the rest goes out to the members. So that's, that 4% is what you're considering gross to the club for the 15% limit, no, correct? So you're saying the whole amount that the village store writes us before we send it out to the members? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So, again, the CR7 is not designed to be a, an IRS compliance tool. So, I, there's, there's, there is absolutely question there. The code seems to indicate that it's gross receipts, which to me, gross receipts means the amount of the check. Now, the way this is structured, it's structured as it's bringing the net forward. So if you were looking for a gross receipt number to build your 15% off of, mm -hmm. that's the best number you've got based on the documentation that's being completed. Okay, so there, there, that appears to be in a, the structure of the form and the language appear to be a little bit in, in conflict. 
yes. don't know exactly what the right answer is. I, I believe I'm going to side on the fact that everywhere else that there is a reference, it talks about gross receipts without offset, which means without subtracting for your expenses. Okay. So that seems wrong if that other language says without offset. Okay. However, I absolutely understand the argument that the members are consigning mm -hmm. um, and the, the club is kind of the conduit to get the stuff to the village store and so we don't have to write 500 checks a month, we only write 30 checks a month. I get that. So I, I understand that argument. And when earlier when folks were talking about, well, it says general and should and that kind of stuff, I believe this is the kind of stuff that would come up in an individual examination okay. for people to say, okay, yeah, we understand the intent. This is really not, but you're just serving as the, as the go-between between the consignment shop and the actual members. So I don't have the exact answer for that. Okay. That, that would be good to get that clarified because that's a 96% discrepancy and it changes everything. No, we know. And that's, the, <laughs> and that's the trouble we run into is, and somebody else referenced this earlier, okay, you got a room full of lawyers, you're going to get a room full of answers. Yeah. yeah. We're sort of running into Because we're already close to our cap without craft fairs. Understood. So, yeah, exactly. So that, that's a big concern for us. Okay, so spinning that a little bit different, we get donations of fabric in our club. We take those fabric, we rebundle it, we sell it back to our members at a discounted price. That money goes into our causes account that we use to sew for charity. So that would be considered in house. In house, but does it fall under the 35% bump? I wouldn't think so because okay. it, you're 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 charging that back to your members. Yes. So okay. Same thing with our stash sale. We all get together and say this is the material we're tired of. We're going to sell it to each other, but we do leave that open to the public. So we need to separate yes. members of the public That's versus part of the, members. Yeah. Okay. Member, non-member accounting. Yes. Okay, good, good. If Rip and Sew were to put on, say, a Soul Splendor event in our courtyard, but not collect any money for that for the village store or the club, the individual members would just sell from the courtyard. Is that allowed? At this point in time, it's been allowed okay um where we're going in the future as far as moving this train back onto the track in adherence to some of these policies mm -hmm. that's in limbo right now we're still okay. trying to get our arms around that had a recent pop-up sale at metal shop we had a clay sale pot party on the mm -hmm. on the patio mm -hmm. you know so those things are we're yeah. continuing to generate we called time out Yep. as far as us trying okay. to get okay. this thing under wraps yep. a little bit. And and the Clay Club did get under the window. They were allowed to run their sales through the yeah, village yeah. store because they met before that deadline. Yep. So that was good. Okay, so yep. as long as we're not collecting money as a club, right now we're allowed to let our members sew or sell as long as they're collecting their own um, sales from that. So they're individually for kinda, right now. Kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. For right now. Okay, good, good. Okay, good. <laughs> Can we advertise our products for sale in the window at our individual club? Um, again, at this point, we were hoping to call time out on that, Pete. I mean, any issue on there, George, as president of the club? <laughs> I mean, really, it comes down to policy at this point. You know, all we're trying to do is, is uh, kind of get, again, I don't want to continue to use the same old slogan, but we want to get this train back on the track and be in mm -hmm. adherence to the policies that are in existence as well as the RRMPs, so we're all playing and singing off the same sheet of music. Okay. At where we go in the future, you know, that's going to be determined. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right now that's up in the air, because I know the Silver Club pulled all their items from the window yeah. that were for sale, so we were concerned about that. We've never advertised our items for sale in the window, so that was asked, can we do that? So a follow-on question on that is, if the member of the public, and we get this a lot, members, and as public, I mean residents here that are not Rip and Sew Club members will come in and say, who makes the microwave bowl covers or who does the double-handed you know, pot holders or whatever? Can we compile a list of members with their permission to hand out to residents that come in asking for these items that say, these are the members that like to make these items? Yeah, I think, I think eventually that's going to be kind of like direction mm -hmm. that I think would work for us. Okay. But again, we just got to get this consignment thing and all the legal issues okay. kind of taken care of. Okay. So um, as long as we're know. not taking a cut off of the top, that yeah. does not I mean, factor anywhere. We'd in love here. to have a gallery. We'd love to have people be able to see the yeah. crafts that are being made here, i.e. Village Store. Mm -hmm. Hand out cards. Have your card underneath the product that you make. Someone mm -hmm. wants to contact you. Okay. 
but as we sit here right now, to make things commercially for profit is basically prohibited as far as our policies go. Okay. So that just needs to be rethought, and, and the governing board um, are the ones that really enact that policy for okay. us to, to take care of. But okay. again, we okay. got a tax attorney in the room, our attorney in the room, and that kind of thing. Okay. And then again, all of these 100 clubs are individual operations that okay. take care of what they do. Okay. So in the past, we've always enforced the hard and fast rule. If you use our club to make an item, you cannot sell it privately from your home or on Etsy or anything like that. We have gotten some guidance from Dor Dory in the past couple months on this. So huh? right now, we're just kind of lifting that because... During the lock-in, a lot of our ladies were sewing like crazy for the craft fair, and then the craft fair didn't happen. So they have an abundance of supplies, and you only have so many grandkids and friends that you can give stuff to. Right. So we've got a stockpile of stuff that we right. need to offload. <laughs> yeah, and there's absolutely no way in the world anyone from the rec centers here mm -hmm. can monitor what you're doing out of your home. Mm -hmm. You know, internet sales and that type of thing. Yep. It is what it is. Yep. Um, you know, again, these clubs are supposed to be for recreational use and, and pleasure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're in the metal shop and you're using a plasma cutter and you're making a nice little logo design for a piece of yard art, that's terrific. Okay. But you start making 35 and 40 of them, mm -hmm. you know, I think yep. the club president should tap you on the shoulders. What are you doing? Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of a point that I wanted to bring up, too. Part of the village store rules is that we were never allowed to put multiple like items in. Yeah. So if I wanted to make a cute and sassy apron and embroider on that and put it in the village store, I couldn't make multiples of those. I could only do one until it was sold and then replace it with the next one. Yeah, great rules. So we're not, th that's a village store rule, but they've never allowed us to mass produce in the store. It had to be individual items. Right. So just to keep that in mind. Okay. Um, one more thing, and this probably came from a very, I, I, I sent out to our membership to give me questions to ask, and so this one's a little bit emotionally charged, but um, we were told uh, back at the, not the last governing board meeting that you had, but the first, the, the one prior to that where we first heard about this, stand by, we need to meet with our lawyers and tax accountants. So I've been telling our members, hold tight, let's not do anything, let them talk to the powers that be. And then the guidance that just came out was consult your own tax tires and lawyers. So that was a little bit conflicting for us and threw us a curve bar because we've been standing by, playing by the rules, waiting for guidance from from you and the, or, and the right, governing right. board. Right. So. Like I said, 103 clubs, mm -hmm. you know, from A to Z, mm -hmm. right? So we got a whole array of what issues that we're trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so to try to find a one umbrella to keep everybody out of the rain isn't that easy. Okay. So we're moving in that direction, mm -hmm. but we're, we're kind of, I don't want to say taking baby steps, but again, we have to get a little bit of a grasp on this. Mm -hmm. And so it, what basically has culminated out of the executive session with the governing board, a workshop with the governing board to where we are today mm -hmm. is rounding up 103 clubs, mm -hmm. notifying you all um, as to why you're here today, mm -hmm. trying to explain as best we can to the quandary we find ourselves in, and then getting us back onto the track as per as the rules exist today, mm -hmm. and then regrouping with the new seating of the governing board to help us move forward. Okay. And I'm certain that, well, yeah. and I, I'm sure I would a lot highly of this recommend that a subcommittee gets developed with mm -hmm. people like you mm -hmm. on a committee to help us get down the trail. Okay. Hey, okay. Bill? And I'm sure this new stuff has come from guidance from what you got from your attorneys and tax advisors, and that's why there was a little bit of turnabout yes, there. And yes. I, let me, I just have something just super brief to add to that. So part of that is, again, wide, wide variety of club activity happening. And we've had a, uh, a couple of clubs say, hey, what if we, you know, give up our 501c7 status and move to a 501c something else? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of this outside attorney and tax stuff is related to, if someone's coming up with something like that, that's advice we can't give you. I can't help you you know, dissolve a chart or dissolve your oh, status yeah. and go to a different status. And each club has their own EIN, mm -hmm. uh, employee, employer identification number, which means that from, from the IRS's standpoint, you're standalone legal entities. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to talk to us about issues for your club because that's not our EIN. So that's sort of where that was going is a lot of that responsibility. If something significant needs to happen, like we're 
going to stop being a chartered club. We're going to give up our tax exempt status. That's the kind of stuff that you would need some counsel outside of what we are set up to do. Okay. okay. And, and to that point, are you still planning on meeting individually with your heavy hitters that you know we have a problem? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Because I'm yeah. pretty sure that we're in the top four or five in sales at every craft fair that we have. So I, we fall into that right. category of oopsie. Right. And we're then over those back limits. to where back to where Tim was going. I mean, we have met several times with Kiva Bridge, for instance, mm -hmm. as they want to continue doing what they're doing and they want to do it legally. Mm -hmm. So they have sought their own um, legal advice okay. and uh, have given up their charter, or they haven't voted on it yet. But mm -hmm. their upcoming meeting, I believe, is next month. Um, to do that, forming their own LLC. Which and club then, is that? The, excuse me, uh, uh, Kiva Bridge. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So sense. they're going to form a, their own LLC. There'll be four members heading up that group. Their president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, all owner members within um, the rec centers here at Sun City West. And they're going to move down our priority list as far as having facilities and giving up their charter. Um, but they're moving towards more of a rental agreement as opposed to a chartered club scenario, that so that if the independent owners like yourselves want to come in and rent a picnic ramada at the park, mm -hmm. you can bring and invite anybody you want to to join you at that party. If you want to have a celebration of life, same kind of thing. You rent these facilities and you can bring everyone in. Mm -hmm. So Kiva has, has taken it upon themselves to go that route to kind of service their needs, and they will be you know renting those rooms from us for them to use on a on a periodic basis to move that program along. Okay. So, Luckily, that's not our problem. No. With Rip and Sew, we just make the money. So <laughs> that's our problem. Yes. yes <laughs> okay. Yes. Great. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. And it that. really, it really is. You know, when you're making money, you know, the, you got to prove to the IRS why you're tax exempt. And a, a social club is. But if you start, you know, mass producing in the in the world of uh, cottage industry, you should be paying tax. Hi, Bill. I'm Patty Hoffert. I'm the president of the SunWest Art Club, and thank you for having us here today. This has been very um, informative, and I appreciate the crew you've brought with you. Um, I have a, I, you've dropped a few hints, and the person in front of me um, alluded to some of the questions I have, and that is about the individual's responsibility. And I'd like to hear your vision for what the future art and craft sales are going to look like. Yeah. I mean, we've got, like I said, we've got options. Um, consignment is something that I think is probably, I don't want to say the easiest fix, but I think that is where um, at least what I'm hearing out of this particular group, other groups that we've got, uh, have met with as far as, you know, maybe moving that forward. Is there a venue here in town that we could um, potentially develop or whatever into a consignment store similar to what we have at the village store or reuse that potentially? Who knows? But I think when it comes to that, you know, in order to do that, I mean, I've had a conversation with George um, over the last couple of days, but there is, I think we're kind of a, like a mile away from that at the moment okay. um, due to the fact that we have all these written policies and programs and procedures in place that would have to be amended. So there's going to be a, a time frame that that has to go through. Got to go through club committee. It's got to go through budget and finance. It's got to go through workshop studies and the, ultimately the governing board to make any kind of policy changes. So that has to all take place. Um, but what would have to happen then would would you know clubs would have to be a little bit more strict on monitoring, um, like it was presented earlier. You know you're not going to mass produce things. Um, got to keep an eye on that kind of thing, um, and then basically get away from um, making contributions to a, uh, the sales going back, the gross receipts going back to a 501c7 tax exempt organization. If these individual crafters are going to put things in a consignment store, they're doing so independently. So I hear you speak about a consignment store in place of the arts and crafts sale? Um, no, the arts and crafts sales, I think, Kind of yes and no. I mean, I think we can figure out a way to do the annual sales or the an twice a year. Mm -hmm. And I think if it's going to be run through the association, be it us, mm -hmm. our special events team, um, I think individual crafters or groups of class, I don't say clubs, but groups of people, mm -hmm. if you wanted to rent a booth to display your wares, great. Okay. We would collect that revenue from us 
and then you as individual crafters would be responsible for the sales of your product. You so that's respond. an individual responsibility and would require an individual tax ID. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So should we start to talk to our groups about how the process for um, Again, I, I would, uh, and any other recommendations that you see that might be an advantage to you, um, I would bring all of those forward. And I, and I see, you know, in the not too near future, right, mm -hmm. with the seating of the new governing board, mm -hmm. I see this at maybe even at the club committee level, getting broken down into a subcommittee, getting some, you know, getting you people involved who've got actual skin in the game mm -hmm. to kind of help push this thing along. So the way I see that, because our particular club takes no money from the artist when there's a sale. So whatever our, our percentage goes, uh, the gross receipts are divided out back to the village store for their commission, sales tax, and our club takes zero. So all of the money that comes back to us that's actually Where would Katie income. be sending that check to? Well, she sends it to our club, but what right, I'm saying okay. is we repay every bit of it back okay. to the artist. So yeah, we're and, not the, and the hiccup in that equation is that check goes back to your club. Right, and I understand that that's okay. part of the gross receipts. I have no problem understanding that part. But, but the part that would be a great advantage for us would be that we would no longer be tied to only studio produced work to be for sale in that event because right. most of our artists actually do their their work out of their studios and home at home because we provide no equipment and no supplies right. we provide instruction and that's it right. so um, f okay so i just want to be sure i'm clear with this to communicate to my members so um, okay, thank you very much. All right. Hi, Bill. Hi, George. I'm Sharon Chesney from, I'm the treasurer from Scrapbooking uh, Paper Crafts. And we're probably on the low end of the revenue stream for most of the clubs here. So this has affected us in a big way. Um, I've got a lot of questions and I kind of don't know where to start and there's so many things out there. So I did want to say that I'm a retired nurse with a liking to excel in figures. And that's probably how I adopted the treasury role. <laughs> and that was two years ago. And so when I read this book, um, I had questions. My first two questions are, what do I do about 1099s? And what about this 990 tax form that's due May 15th? And I was told, we don't do 1099s, and don't worry about the tax form. By who? I'm not going to point fingers. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Sharon? It was. So 1099s would be for vendors that you're paying, not club members. OK. Uh, the 990T, n n not in play at this time. Okay, that's what I was told. So I guess what really boggles my little mind here is, re and I get it, you've said it more than once about how this train is off the track, but you've got the fiduciary responsibility, as you told us in the April meeting, which I was at, mm -hmm. and I'm like, and I'm not trying to dig up old stuff, but how did we ever get here to name, I think it was this lady here in the white, you know, and my parents, I've been here since 1980. My parents owned here and my father sold wooden ducks in this village store 40 years ago. And so I know how it was run then. But it's like, if I could figure this out with my little bit of knowledge, that, and it says that we can't take stuff for profit. And I'm not, believe me, I respect you. I wouldn't want your job or George yours. But where were you guys that you could not figure this out? This thing about we're not in it for a profit. Part of this thing about not being in it for a profit, when I read that sentence, it means to me, hey, if I've got an outside business and I sell glue, I can't come to the glue and to the paper craft club and set up my little glue display and say, okay, I'm selling my glue. This is for my own personal business. I'm not talking about selling my cards or whatever. So I get that. You cannot profit from that. And the same thing, you get all these attorneys and all these accountants and everybody else reading these rules, you get all these different interpretations. 
now the thing about so that I just had to get that off my chest. Okay. One other thing I got to get off my chest before I come up to the thing. At the April 7th meeting, you and you George stood there. Yeah, it is. It really is. You guys both requested you want your you know, you told us about this stuff. We sat there for however long it was and listened till this came up. You requested for we want club membership to be on the subcommittee for the taxation. Mm -hmm. Go to the website, fill out a form. We want everybody involved because we know the clubs need to participate. I did that. I never heard hoot from anybody until the May 7th meeting. And let me get her name. Um, Ann Brown was in charge of that subcommittee, and she named all 10 or 11 or nine people that were there, of which nine of the 10 were either board members or rec center employees. And then they said, well, Ken Holtz, who I don't know who he is, somebody had some sports thing, but Lisa Vines, who is also a board member, if I am correct, but she has a couple involvement in a couple of the craft clubs. So you made it to sound that she was representing the craft clubs. How insulting was that to, I think, me, and I'm sure a lot of the rest of the community, you were asking for involvement. You never, that's like the fox garden, the hen house, if you ask me. I understand this is an ugly problem, and maybe you didn't want everybody's feedback in there, but both of you requested people to apply. I did. It was a waste of my time. Nobody can even send me an email, thanks but no thanks, until I found out then they had one or two closed meetings to discuss this. And then we find out the stuff that's in the paper and the letter from you and everything else. And I don't think that was right. And I don't think that was fair. If you don't want us involved, then don't go out there and ask us to fill out the applications and get this stuff involved and then not even have anybody. There was nobody, who was representing the clubs yeah. at that meeting? Well, that's the only alternative I can come with. Everybody, nine out of the 10 people were either board members or rec center employees. All right, well, let's, let's check your numbers. Okay. But give me a little bit of an opportunity to respond to that. Okay. Ann Brown is the chairman, she's a governing board director, and Correct. she's the chairman of the Budget and Finance Committee. Okay. And she was heading up yep. a, a subcommittee. Right. I don't know how many applications she received. That was not part of our purview. Got it. But there, the, yes, there were staff involved. Our accounting team, myself, our CFO, mm -hmm. um, President George, yes, he sits on the board, mm -hmm. and, as well as Ann. Mm -hmm. Lisa Vines. Mm -hmm. um, Gary Bassick. Has, has he in finance? Uh, no, he's not in finance. He's on the budget. He's on the budget and finance committee. Okay. Um, but he represented the the clubs that were dealing with um, outside membership, be it the dance groups and the card playing groups. That was Mr. Bosick's um, call and claim to fame as far as Ann recruiting him to serve on the board. Lisa Vines was representing the um, craft clubs. She's she also a board member. She is not on the governing board. She has not been seated yet. She she's ran a new, for election. She's an upcoming board member. Upcoming board member, correct. Okay. But as we sit here today, no. And then uh, uh, Ken Holtz mm -hmm. is a representative Sports. of all of the uh, clubs representing outdoor sports activity and advertising. Mm -hmm. Well, I just think, I mean, do you see how it looks? I mean, you guys put out this request for everybody to, and then, could you not even have sent me an email saying thanks, no thanks, you're not even, we don't need your help? That would have been the courteous thing to do. That would have been nice. We will forward okay. that on to the administrative office. Okay, thanks. I think... Um, I am not part of the governing board's office, no. That belongs to George, his, uh, his, his uh, uh, executive secretary, and Ann Brown, the governing board director. Not to pass blame, I'm, I'm saying I'm part of that team, but that was all run through the governing board. Thank you. Well, no, I just think it's a valid point. You asked for all this input, and there were all those committee members there, and then people apply, and then you look at the, at the subcommittee for two close, one or two closed meetings, and there's really not a lot of clubs there represented. So yeah, it is a big trust uh, issue. Um,
I get it. I understand that. And that's fine, you know, that it's really two issues. It's that, but it's also the fact that out of these 10 or 12 people, whoever were on there, okay, there were, you named the sports guy and you named Lisa Vines. She's an upcoming board member. It really doesn't look like there's a lot of representation from the 103 chartered clubs that we have. To your point, this is right here. Okay. Yeah, I know, you said, they said that, and I get that, but I'm just saying, you were pleading with people to apply to be on this committee. <clears throat> okay, okay. Well, four, okay, is what percent of 103, okay? That's a four percent. A committee of 103 would not go very And I far. understand that wholeheartedly. I understand that. Okay. Um, you mentioned something. I just needed some clarification. You said that the other Del Webb communities, nobody else has a village store, or what do other communities do? We have put a reach out. Oh, okay. Um, I missed that. I didn't We've put a reach that. out to the 20 or so Del Webb 55 plus communities that we like to compare ourselves to when it comes to our annual fees. Um, haven't found one yet. Uh, I think there may have been one. Did you guys finally turn one up in Tucson? Oral Valley. Oral Valley? Okay. So we were, we're researching with them as far as that goes. I do not know at this point in time whether their club, whatever kind of tax status their clubs have or how they operate. I think we did eventually find one village. Del Webb's, uh, um, communities that he has developed to kind of go by, but uh, no. But if we did find one, I think it would be a terrific model to use. Okay. Um, but again, uh, not readily available. Okay, all right. Because somebody told me that Sun City does some kind of a craft fair in the fall. They do. And we're just wondering, how do they do that? Is there any way thing we can model off of that? They, no, no. they do, and they limit the amount of sales to $50,000 or less on an annual basis for all of their clubs. Okay. And that is for Tim. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that as far as how they deal with their taxation and that type of thing. They do not have a village store as far as that goes. They do not have, so hence the amount of, of merchandise being sold on a daily basis is very, very, very minimal. I mean, you'd have to know where these clubs actually are to find them, i.e. metal, i.e. wood. Uh, you know, rip and sew, all, you know, all of those, they're kind of tucked away. They're not, not a lot of heavy foot traffic. They're not bringing people right through, you know, membership and here, come to our village store and look at all this wonderful stuff. That doesn't exist. So they have two sales, I think, annually um, that they rent a hall or they use their hall similar to this and rent booths out to the individual clubs that do sell things. So it is a consignment based scenario. Rec centers gets a cut the individual clubs get a cut and the and the crafts people get cuts at the end of the show um, but again I believe they they monitor their annual sales to less than 50k well the, in the um, RRMPs, it says that the village store is set up and that's why we don't do the 1099 well I'm sorry I, I understand that but it says here that the village store they are held on consignment and therefore they're not the property of the village store, they're the pro it's the, our property. So if the village store is set up and things are held as consignment, I don't understand all the... Right. But, and That's it, why there's lawyers. Okay. Um, my last thing, and I know you'll be glad to get rid of me here. Um, no. I, you, I'm good. Or, I'm sorry, there were two things. I think you had said that the attorneys had vetted the policies and they are not going to be changed, or are they going to be changed? I cannot speak for the governing board. I don't change policy. They, they, they create policy and they tell me to. 
the RRMPs. Yeah. It is in hand right now what the tax situation will be in Well, I get that, but I mean, it's like page 25 that says that we cannot, we're not authorized to seek professional counsel unless we. Those are, those are things that we have to change, okay? Okay. As we go through this, remember, we're here sitting and we're trying to have, we have problems. There's no, I get no it. Deny we have problems, mm -hmm. okay? Do we want to fix it, fix it quick, knee jerk like we've done in the past, or are we going to take the opportunity to fix it, fix it once, and fix it right? Okay. That is, that, Listen, I say that I, with um, the staff and Bill and the general manager, uh, we want to fix this once and fix it right. Because it has gone on, and like what happened, the train got off the tracks, one part, not to steal that from Bill. But moving forward is that it's not going to get back on the tracks until it's put where it should be. We okay. To, we have to do it once and do it right. Um, my last clarification issue is uh, this definition of gross receipts, and I understand what they're writing. Um, I guess the part that I have trouble with is when we get this report, I get the report from the village store. So um, we, too, do take 0% for our club. All the money goes back to the artist for our 2 and $3 card items that we sell. Um, I guess... Um, what bothers me is they're saying we have to report total revenue just because it's coming to the club, but I've got documentation via that report, it tells me exactly who gets how much, and at the end of the year, I can tell you exactly who gets how much. If I have to keep a separate spreadsheet, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, so I guess it's understanding this gross receipts that I don't get. It's the money that, the revenue, yes, it goes to the club, but you can see out of the $500, $500 went to the members. So why am I reporting $500 when the club didn't get $500? That's the understanding of this, just like you put five attorneys in a room or five financial people or whoever, doctors, you're gonna get five different answers. Right. And so if we make, we actually started making projects to make money for the club. I said, forget it. We're not doing that anymore because we're going to get penalized and have to pay taxes on that money. But if, if you can, I can show you that the $500 went right back to all the members. Why is the club reporting that as gross revenue? Okay, so right now you're not. Sharon. I'm sorry. said right now you're not. Correct. Because of that, and I, as I indicated earlier, I have okay. no intent on changing this form at this point. Okay. Because that's their, the definition that they use would indicate that that form is wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, the kind of spirit of the thing is exactly what you said, and Rip and So same way. You're paying all this money back out. I believe that's why this is, was formed the way it was. So it, it technically is excluded from that part of the math. That's one of the questions that we need to get answered. And we're not being, a, at this point, not able to get a really solid, committed response from anybody at this juncture. All I can go is by, here's what the tax code says. Tax code stinks. I spent way too much time even as a student going through that, which is why I absolutely steered away from being a tax accountant. Oh my God. Um, so I, 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 right now, you're, right now, this is how it's listed. Okay. So there will be more clarity as, as we get it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm Sheila Makasak from the Beaters Club. Bill, if, uh, to make a smooth transition for us, if you put together a, a list of consultants, could you maybe do a little cheat sheet to let the clubs know if you want to make yourself a business, these are the steps you're going to have to do. Because I think if the members realize how onerous it could be, 
they would be educated to make the decision which way they want to go. Certainly can. Well, thank you. If a club, if we participate in like your craft fair, however it um, morphs, whatever it morphs into, and we have to have a business license to collect the tax, does that put our um, 501c7 in jeopardy? Potentially, right? So that's, that, that's kind of what we're looking at as far as that goes. Um, again, it really comes down to policies, procedures, and, and those types of things and the rules that are enacted by our governing board, right? Because as of right now, if you, if you drop your 501c7, you lose your charter. And then if we lose our charter, we lose our space. Yep, potentially, yep. Okay. So it's a tangled web. Now, to, to let me throw something quick in about the tax exempt or the, the business license thing. So being that the C7 is, as we've seen in these definitions, non-profitable purposes. Mm -hmm. So if you went out and applied for a TPT license, so I would strongly not recommend doing that because then you're broadcasting to them that your intent is to have profit profit Okay, see so those two things don't work well together Okay, Does that makes sense. Yep okay. Now I have another question kind of If you're renting facilities to clubs or tables to us That's bringing money into the rec center. Yes, ma'am how does that affect your status? We are 501c4. Yeah. So we have different rules by which we um, operate via the tax code. Okay. We have golf courses, bowling alleys, and whatnot that are open to the general public. Revenue comes in as far as that goes. So it's a different world than the 501c7 social club scenario. My final question. You know there are a lot of nonprofits that have a profit side of the business. Absolutely. Is that anything the rec center could look at? Um, again, this is, this is our intent to kind of help the clubs, individual organizations, abide by the IRS tax rules. As of right now, we don't, I don't really personally care how much revenue or bank each individual club has, right? That's up to the individual clubs. I mean, the, the ARC club, is. There, I mean, they de generate hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, they auction off cars, they buy cars, and they fix cars, and they, and they donate them. Um, we don't really concern ourselves with where that money goes outside of that club, right? The IRS is concerned with one thing, and that's revenue. And they claim, if you are a 501c7 social club, their main concern is your revenue. And th under their rules, they think you should be operating for recreation and pleasure. The words commercial sales, the word sales, the word profit shouldn't exist in your world as a social club. It should be membership dues, the fun and games that you do, party and have a cake, those types of things. Buy yourself some new sewing equipment with the membership dues that you collect great and that really is the role and function of a social club be it the women's club be it the men's club boomers those types of clubs get together for social and recreational function when you start mixing that with the sale and profit of things that is where you get tripped up on the tax thing because the irs is saying why in the world are you tax exempt when you're essentially a business okay thank you Marty Cantrell from the Clay Club. And to follow up on that last conversation there, so could we be could we make ourselves 501c4, and do we lose our charter if we do that? I am no, you wouldn't lose your charter. I mean, you're, you'd be still have nonprofit status, but that would be something that again, I'm not I'm not your lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, um, but again, you have 501c. You have 29 options. Yeah. Right? You can be your graveyard if you want to. You start planting people. Um, um, but really, you have to qualify for that. Yeah. And so Arizona Department of Revenue and the IRS, are, are gonna, you're going to have to prove to them who you are and what you do. 
So 501c3, you've got all these things you got to do community-wide and teach and educate and donate and all kinds of things like that as far as the stipulations and rules to be able to qualify for a 501c3. 501c4, not so much. I mean, you could go to uh, obviously the web page and, and read up on you know what we are. We are a homeowners association. Right. That's what qualifies us to be a 501c4, um, five, six, seven, all the way out to 29. Well, um, and that some of the language I think pertain to serving a group of people, which you could maybe yeah. stretch that to my people in the Clay Club. Yeah. I don't know. That's not my real question, but I just wanted to follow up on that and ask the question, if we became a 501c4, if we deemed that was the right way to go, and I don't know. Yeah, if you became a 501c anything, you would still have a chartered club here. All right. Thank you very much. I'd like to shift gears for just a minute. They've all asked a lot of questions that I had on my sheet, but we won't repeat them. But I, uh, if the club, if a club is in a situation where they want to do a remodel, let's say it's major, someplace between twenty-five and fifty thousand dollars, yes, ma'am, something like that. How are we going to do that in the future? Because most clubs do not have the ability to go to a bank and right. finance anything like that, but they also may not have the ability to pay it out of their assets right. without running their assets too low. Right. How are we going to address that? And that that's the responsibility of us as the association managers as well well as the governing board. You all pay annual dues into this association, as well as people moving in here, paying a $3,500 APF fee to help offset capital improvements that we do every year. I think we're moving forward with, what, $5.9 million worth of improvements coming up starting in July if the budget gets approved in a couple of weeks. So there's a process involved where clubs fill out forms that all have titles and names. You would simply file a form, um, I believe by September 1st, and there's a whole, there's a whole process right. that goes through there, right? Our project manager looks at things and starts sorting things out dollar-wise. Mr. Finelli in the back of the room has a spreadsheet longer than I think the state of Arizona with everything we own that has a value over $5,000. And so we know in time when these things need to be replaced. So that is our reserve study. So we know to have enough money in our bank, we're sitting currently on about $28 million. So Pete basically manages those funds on an annual basis, on a daily basis, looking at things that break down if we have to fix things. But we have a plan that shows every year where we think we're going to be as far as need goes. Golf irrigation systems, fixing air conditioners, all that. It's all identified by line item. You then would come via a form to uh, in, enter into the system that you need $50,000 something, right? It's explained, it's presented, it goes through committee, be it clubs probably for initiation, off to facilities, budget and finance, and gets presented through our, our accounting and finance department to the governing board for blessing. And that typically is the process. And that should be how it, how it works. I keep using the example of in these meetings that we have, a, a, a couple of months ago, as we're compiling our budget for this new fiscal year starting in July, the pickleball representatives show up at, at budget meetings and, and they, they want to expand pickleball, right? They need 18 new courts and they want to use the par additional parking areas out at Palm Ridge. And it's $2 million. And they basically come forward and say, we'll help pay for that, right? And they're willing to sign a paper that they presented to us and say, we're going to give you $960,000 over the next 10 years, 15 years, I believe. And so we simply, as we're trying to get through this mess, we're like, well, how are you paying for that? Well, we'll advertise and we'll have tournaments and we'll bring in all this outside money. Time out, right? Can't do that. And so that's kind of where we're at. We don't want you as a retiree enjoying yourself in the clay club, worrying about running around trying to find a sponsor or funds for $50,000 to pay us back. No. Right. We want you to be able to enjoy your club and retire and have the recreational pleasure that you have living here. That's our goal. So if you need a $50,000 advancement, if, if stained glass needs some help, new tables and new this and new that, they should come forward to us, the administrators, 
to be able to have that processed through what we do every year. And then hence, it gets budgeted and every July 1, new money comes out and we take care of you. So uh, if a club had some assets that they could expend towards this, but it's certainly not the whole amount, you would accept those assets though, right? Uh, the, the gentleman in the orange shirt back there, Mr. Finelli. <laughs> no, so we as a club, no, you would not accept those. Okay, so we as a club just need to present this project and say we know it's either going to be a yes or it's going to be a no, and if it didn't get a yes this year, do we come back next year and we do it again? And Bill, Bill has referenced this before, but one of the reasons we wouldn't want to do that is that it, it influences the decision by who can generate the most money. And if you think about it, that just disqualifies it almost right away. All right. Well, I and, and I appreciate that. Okay, one last final question, I'll let this go. So in the past, when we had these $7 million worth of sales going through um, the village store and we had 16% going back to the operation somehow uh, of income, how are you gonna replace that and how is the rec center gonna replace that um, Well, at this point, revenue? That, that $7 million was a gross ticket. So 16% of that was going, I better use the microphone, they'll yell at me. 16% mm. um, of that was coming back to the association to offset the cost of sales tax and the cost of the staff at the village store. No. Six, no. So, yeah, um, it was. No. Right, for, and its, its primary purpose was labor, credit card fees, all that stuff, which, um, it did not cover. Okay, so there's nothing, if the you know, the labor and the credit card fees and that stuff aren't there, this, the, the 16, it's, it, it, it doesn't detract anything from the rec center's financial statements by not having it. Because we it's actually, we spent more than 16, we spent more than the 16% to operate the facility. So it actually would end up in the other direction. Well, my question was whether or not we as clubs should anticipate possibly being, because currently we do not pay utilities, we don't do those things, we enjoy the facilities, and just whether or not, as I speak to my members, to tell them we're continuing with that and it's okay. And I hear you saying yes, it's okay as long as the budget balances. And $28 million in assets based on this community is not a big amount of money, really. Well, it's what, Pete, about 55% of us being totally fully funded as far as everything we know we have to build for the next 30 years. I hope so. And the governing board has set a floor for us to, as far as our, when we allocate annual money year in and year out for our budgets, that that reserve fund cannot drop below 40%. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time. Catherine Doyle, treasurer for Lapidary. Um, I have a question that if the club changes its status, a number of clubs, say lapidary, silver, um, metal, wood, all that equipment, at that point, what? And if we go into a cottage industry or whatever, do we then have to pay for utilities, for space? What about the equipment? What happens? Well, all that equipment is, I believe, owned by the association. Right. So that, that basically would stay there. Obviously the intent is to not have these things go away. We want to make these things remain functional as far as it is legal and according to code. So I don't see them going away. I see these facilities kind of maintaining themselves throughout existence. As Even long. if we changed our tax status. Um, I think so, but I think I think once you once you kind of kind of put your feet in those waters, I, I think you're going to see how difficult that might be. Your social clubs, right? Your social clubs in Sun City, your social clubs in Sun City, San Diego, Las Vegas, South Carolina, Florida, North Carolina, social clubs, C sevens. That's the intent for your recreational use and the pleasure of using those clubs. They should not be incubators for commercial sales in the world of Dell Webb and in the IRS. Okay, and what about the store coming back? Excuse me? What about the store? Again, 
policies would need to have to be rewritten because right now policy says we shouldn't be doing that. If the governing board believes that a consignment store or individual craftspeople should be compensated for crafting their wares, we're going to have to change something along those lines to make it right. The IRS would basically want you to be paying taxes on any profit you made in a business. And so that all has to be legalized. And like I said, we're about a couple of miles away from home there, but we're working on getting somewhere there to provide options to the board to move forward. So there's no deadline about when that might be decided or anything? Not at this point, ma'am, no. What about the craft fair? We've Same. been told that we will have a craft fair this fall, right. are we? The fall is the fall. Mm -hmm. What happens between now and the fall, a lot of things are going to change. Like I said, I think there's an opportunity for us to do that as far as individual people, not clubs, representing those individual booths. If you would like to have a booth with your name on it, you would pay a booth fee and sell your wares. You would then be responsible for paying the appropriate tax and everything associated with your business. And where you made that product, I don't know. You could have made it in your garage, you could have made it in your backyard. It could have been your aunt or your niece, whatever you sell out there. Beef jerky or whatever. I don't think we have a beef jerky club yet, but I'd like to see one. Not yet. Um, so it could still be made in the club? At this point in time, um, you are jeopardizing your club's tax status by doing so. Until you guys answer us. Now, I do have one question. You keep talking about attorneys. Are the attorneys that we have, are they tax attorneys? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I can't speak for that. Right? Hi, I'm Sue Casey with the Beaters Club. And before I retired, I was a CPA. And under generally accepted accounting principles, a financial statement like your C7 has to be taken, the, all of the schedules are part of the whole financial statement to be taken as a whole. Now, page four says, just exactly like everyone's made the point, it's net of what people are paid for as an artist. And I think that you even uh, recognize that to some extent in the art, uh, our, our our RPs. One of the points that I noticed right away, club officers must periodically remind members that the sale program is authorized only under the association sponsorship and is designed specifically to foster the membership growth and financial report, financial support needed by craft related clubs. So I'm not talking about the golf courses or I'm talking about stained glass. I was a treasurer for two years uh, before for copper enameling, and I filled out two of those C7s during my tenure. And I had an opportunity to talk to Earl Mackert about it, and he, pre he repeatedly told me that the club are supposed to be social, uh, for social members, so go out and have a party, and but part of your own RRMP says that the sales program is to support the membership and financial support of the craft clubs. So I don't see that we have a problem, because even the IRS doesn't charge taxes on cost of goods sold, which is essentially what ha is when we pay back the artists. So I just do not see how any of these tax attorneys can say uh, that beaters sold $500 of items. We, I think we take 3%. I have no problem with the 3% being up there, but you don't pay on the cost of, of goods sold, the artist needs to probably pay that, but, and if they don't get a 1099 from any of the clubs, if they don't pay over um, $600, and 
when I, uh, we were pretty careful to make sure that we never had an instructor that made over $600. And the same, pro I imagine we can check our records and see if we did. Now also that 990 form you were talking about, Earl told me that they, we, we um, all signed off on that under some agreement with the IRS probably five years ago where we didn't have to do it annually. And I don't know if that's still the case, but somebody can look into that, but that's an annual report, so I thought that was kind of odd. But it also told me that Earl Mackert had a lot of conversations with the IRS. And if that's the official financial statements that they're looking at, they must have known that we were paying back the artists as similar to a cost of goods sold. So that is not gross revenue. Net revenue, I can see, but not that, that is not gross. The way the financial statement is set up with your, pay, with your schedule four is correct. And I'm sure the IRS has probably signed off on that for 40 years. So has anybody talked to Earl Mackert? He has certainly been. No, he's not. No, he's not. I found him. Yeah, it says he's 91 years old. Tim, you want to touch that? <laughs> okay. So I'm with you on the page four rolling through to the front page. Again, we've talked about that on a couple of occasions. The bigger picture here isn't whether that club stuff is gross or net, because either way, even though that this is still displaying net for the village store and the craft fairs, there's still, it's still outside. And there's still a ton of clubs, or not a ton of clubs, but there are still too many clubs that are well over the 15%. Whether it's net or gross, it's still outside. Okay? So I, I understand that. It's just, it's either a bigger number or a smaller number, but either way, they're still way over the 15% from outside sources. Uh, I take exception to that, because okay. our club, if you take off the Ma'am, uh, I was not referring to your club specifically. I said okay, there are a well, handful. Okay, well, there's probably 50 craft clubs in here that can say the same thing. I know, but we have 103 clubs. We have one set of rules. And you have the, the club that had the beginning of all this mess, two to one outsiders and lots of outside revenue, and now they're going to be an LLC. I have no problem with that, but your RRPs say that the original association set up the village store in order to foster the membership growth and financial support needed by craft-related clubs. Right, the support of the clubs, not profit of the members. There's a difference there. Uh, not, uh, I, okay. okay, that's well, all I got. I, I, I'm not going to argue with you, but I think I made a couple points, and I'll go find Mr. Mackert's telephone number. One, one more point. Um, you talk about running factories. Uh, I can speak for uh, Lapidary, where we have, I, I've looked at the, about the last 11 years, and uh, I think our biggest year, we had 12.5% of our members sold items through the village store. Okay. Some sold one item, some sold a lot more. But it's not the clubs running sweatshops, it's some individuals consigning their materials to the village store for sale. The club is an intermediary. Someone's making a profit. Someone should be paying tax in the eyes of the IRS. No, you're right. But the clubs are providing the venue for that. If you want to be in business, go in your garage and open a business. If you want to recreate for pleasure, use a social club. There's the equipment, we buy some of our own equipment to use on the 
To recreate for pleasure. Yes. Correct. We have to do that. We have to buy our materials. Right. But that's part of recreational pleasure. If I make things out of wood, I got to buy product too. You're making stuff, selling it, so you can afford to go to the club and make your stuff and have fun. Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. 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 But again. Right. And like, like Tim said, probably the vast majority of people in this room are not the problem. Right? You're not the problem. However, we have one umbrella to keep you all out of the rain. What do I tell the guy in the metal shop that's mass producing NFL logos to splash all over everybody's wall? When he walks in the back of the room and buys $25,000 worth of metal to put on the plasma cutter to make designs for people to buy at arts and crafts fairs and bazaars from here to Iowa. What do you say to that? He's not paying tax on any of that, and we're providing that incubator venue. What about the guy that has the wood shop truck parked in behind the wood shop, and he's putting in kitchen cabinets in everybody's home? How do you <laughs> tell him to stop it? You think? Yeah. Now, the guy who should be looking at that is the other end of the consignment, the guy who's selling it for him. Maybe he shouldn't accept those 4,000 items. Or the officers of the club. Oh, the officers of the club that are sponsoring that. That's an independent agency. Excuse me? Excuse me? Correct. Well, it seems like maybe this afternoon, uh, maybe uh, I mean, the time and the issues heard certainly not be wasted on us. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, uh, we should all be able to go home and, and the next club meeting say, we'll just continue to mind our P's and Q's, do as we're, we've been doing all along. Mm -hmm. well, okay. <laughs> well, as far as we as far as we are here today, right? Our goal today was to present you this issue. How you as organizations deal with it, you deal with it. You have to answer as individual clubs to the IRS on an annual basis. If they come knocking at your door and want to go back a few years to look at your revenue, right? You answer to them. And so if you want to face any kind of fine, we're trying to prevent you from doing that. We are stopping the, the way, remember the, that we're not allowed to deal with the IRS unless you get a copy of everything in the, the every interchange in our charter. Okay. But again, we're just advising you to simply play by the rules that are in place. That's all we can ask you to do. They are conflicting, and that's why we're trying to fix it. But in order to fix it, we simply have to get the train back on the track and get everybody playing by the same rules. You are social clubs. And with that. Everybody in this room is waiting for an answer on what we're going to do about the fall Right. Right. And so, right. And we don't have an answer right now. We don't. Because if you, again, it comes down to. We are, not, we are not renting booths to the clubs because that's contributing to the problem. 
So if we do a craft fair and individual artists may want to buy their own booth, that is a direction we're looking into, but there's legal ramifications associated with that. And so when we come up with any kind of game plan re regarding the upcoming fair, our special events team will be presenting that to all of you. So. We didn't make that. That went back to the clubs. Okay, so to answer your question, the association does file a 990T and a 99T related to the commissions we make from the village store. Yes. If there are no further questions, I just want to thank you all for coming. Just one more, Bill. Now that we've all, now that we're the third group that you've briefed, is the rec center planning out putting out clarification guidelines for all the clubs? Yes. Because we all will hear and perceive and repeat different yes, things. Yes, the memo that went out, obviously, to get everybody here. Yes. Again, the three meetings synthesized. We will finalize that report and get that back to you. Great, thank you.